a question and answer period. Please, if you have a question you want to direct it to a specific one of the speakers, please so indicate. Um, or if you want to direct it to both, please, since we have limited time, please use your time to ask questions and save any um, extra future comments or statements for the coffee break that falls. So um, please raise your hand if you would like to ask a question. Then you can stand up to your hand so you have more visible. Thank you. Bill Jones from Penny Knight Technology. We're a small manufacturer of precision tooling and machines, and a lot of the data is multinationals. When do we enter into the conversation? We talk about the small, medium manufacturers that make up most communities. I recognize the multinationals have more power, but how do we enter and bring that into the conversation? Because I could give you some examples, but they do, what, what, what do I want to go into all those things? <laughs> um, uh, so, so I like I so I let me first clarify that I'm tasked with the uh, the topic of talking about implications for multinational firms. So it's definitely a very narrow, you know, conversation I uh, um, presentation I gave. So the small medium enterprises were not part of my discussion so much, but I think. Um, so I have to, if I, if I have to speculate about what about small medium enterprise, I think you know the push to source domestically could be, you know, in short, a good news for some of the small medium enterprises because that way you know you will have lower trade costs and you will not you will not have to pay you know high, high tariffs uh, when you when you import components. So so to that extent, I think it could be a good news for the small medium enterprise. Um, in fact, um, so one one article I read um, by um, two trade economists, one is Keith Head and, and his co-author, and he did a counterfactual analysis on automobile industries, and he um, analyzed the impact of um, what he called trumpet. Um, it's thirty-five percent tariff on Mexico, and then um, and then if, what if? Mexico retaliates with 35% tariff on the U.S. And what he found was the U.S. share of uh, output uh, in automobile industry will rise slightly, and that could part of that could be because of the you know the sourcing substitution from foreign uh, firms to domestic you know suppliers, but of course at the expense of huge decrease in consumer surplus because of the increasing prices. Uh, so so that's what I can say I guess at the moment. Michael, do you want to add anything? Yes. Stand up and tell us where you're from. I'm Emilio, NYU. Um, I have a question. Donald Trump has repeatedly said that he wants to lower taxes for multinational corporations so they come to the U.S. and invest in the U.S. How would that affect all the models that you guys have been talking about and how investment like exports would change and imports would change and stuff like that? Um. So, one thing um, I, I want to point out from the literature is, surprisingly, it might be surprising, um, that the literature actually finds very ambiguous evidence on the role of corporate tax in FDI, uh, in inward FDI, okay? Which, what to, what to us, could be surprising because we were all anticipating a negative effect, right? The higher the corporate tax, the less likely foreign investors will invest in a country. However, I think the more you think about it, it actually makes sense because, as we know, multinational firms do a lot of transfer pricing, right? So that mitigates the effect of e effective corporate tax in host country. Right, um, and you know the main f motives for multinational firms to invest abroad are either market access or you know comparative advantage. So the role of corporate tax is actually not that clear from the evidence point of view. So so if we lower corporate tax for multinational firms, it's not clear to me even actually how big the impact would be. Um, and we already have a lot of treat, you know, treaties and you know, deals that would you know, um, allow multinational firms to get credits back from their home country governments. So that further mitigates the effect of host country corporate tax on multinational firms. I would just briefly add, you know, the United States has has entered into bilateral investment treaties mostly out of an interest of protecting outbound investment interests. Um, 
but but you know that's that's changing. I mean, part of the reason the Chinese are so anxious to do a deal with us is for the greater certainty that comes with having uh, treatment of investment uh, not only subject to uh, U.S. legal procedures but also subject to uh, an international uh, agreement. Uh, so my expectation is that Chinese investors, like all investors, uh, would continue to use the U.S. legal system uh, to redress any problems. But the existence of that treaty is also uh, uh, something that increases certainty uh, and therefore can uh, affect investment flows. On the tax treaties just mentioned, um, you know, uh, I think one important uh, it's relatively small, but I mean, there are a backup in, of uh, tax treaties waiting uh, for Senate ratification, and they've got to resolve an issue that uh, Senator Paul has uh, with respect to the protection of personal privacy and uh, tax information. Um, but that, that would be another thing that we get those tax treaties through as well uh, that, that could have um, investment enhancing effects. Yes, Michael. So, Michael Moore, GW, uh, and this is for Michael Smart. Um, you didn't talk, about, I don't believe, about CFIUS, uh, and not everyone knows about this process. And I was wondering if you could uh, speculate a bit on what the range of options would be for uh, for Trump administration to in use that to affect uh, foreign direct investment. Yep. Um, yeah, just ran out of time. <laughs> um, <laughs> So um, here is an area um, where I think Trump is very much swimming with the tide. Um, and I say that with respect to inbound Chinese um, investment. Um, you know, we, I think there's really mixed opinion um, in the US. You have mayors and governors uh, and state officials very eager to attract uh, this Chinese investment. And at the federal level, um, lots of concerns uh, with uh, national security implications. And you had last year for, I think, only the second time ever, the, the president um, blocked a, a proposed transaction uh, from a Chinese investor. Um, uh, so uh, this one was going to ripen whoever was elected president. And the fact that uh, uh, Trump has expressed uh, the desire for a, a, a much tougher policy on China, which, as I said, treats us fairly. Uh, one channel for that will be the CFIUS review process. And the, the now Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer has talked about this for a long time, that, that basically ideas of reciprocity uh, should be uh, a criterion for the review of inbound uh, Chinese investment. In other words, could a similarly situated U.S. investor make the same investment in the same sector in China? And if not, that should be a consideration as to whether the committee uh, green lights the investment. I, I think it's difficult within the existing law to make the connection between incremental risk to national security in the United States and the availability to make a similar investment in China by a U.S. investor. But I'm just describing a, a political dynamic, I think, that has a lot of uh, momentum. Um, and uh, you've got an, an expert on your next panel. I'd encourage you to ask uh, Jim that question uh, as well. Uh, what, not everyone may know what CFIUS is. Oh, sorry. Just, uh, right. So uh, the, this is the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. Um, it reviews those uh, investments in the United States by foreigners that acquire a majority interest or controlling interest um, in uh, an existing U.S. Uh, enterprise. And um, CFIUS, actually my colleague told me yesterday, had its uh, busiest year ever reviewing some 200 or something transactions and is off to a quick start this year already. So uh, this is the group that, that looks at the investment, both the investor, the technology that's being acquired, whether there are contracts with the government, to see if any of this raises a national security interest. And if it does, they have various options to address that. They can require divestment of certain assets, or as I say, they can block a transaction uh, altogether. So it is grounded in the idea that certain investments can raise national security concerns, and at that point, the government should step in um, and, and, as I say, either block or mitigate. Um, 
uh, but, but there is now this uh, increasing concern to give that uh, definition uh, of national security broader meaning. So, so one if, thing I could, if I could just add one mm. thing and just turn the mm. definition, unlike some countries, CFIUS is, is review is limited in terms of sectors. It has to it has to make the case that national security is involved, as opposed to Canada, where, for example, the case has to be made that the, it, the foreign investment is of net economic benefit to Canadians. And that's much, much broader. And so in order to use CFIUS to block foreign investment, you either have to change the existing legislation or you have to be willing to call things national security related that have not been considered national security related in the past, which of course is not out of the question. Go ahead. So let me just add a little bit more background. So FDI coming out of emerging countries like China is the fastest growing component of FDI around the world. And most of these FDI does take the form of merchant acquisitions. So any sort of policy changes in that regard can have potentially profound implications for US inward FDI. And the US inward FDI can be a very important um, you know, driver of employment um, because you know, inward FDI creates more jobs. So other questions? Uh, Wayne Morrison with CRS. There seems to be a sort of a, tr a contradiction when it comes to uh, foreign investment uh, in Congress. So on the one hand, you, you're, you're hearing about reciprocity all the time. But at the same time, uh, there's this fear that jobs are being shipped overseas. So if we have a bilateral investment treaty, no matter how good it looks, there's going to be so many members are going to say, well, this is just a job shipping you know, treaty. And then a treaty is a two-thirds majority required in the Senate. So I was wondering if there's any optimism in the table that then in fact, such an agreement could be negotiated with the Chinese. I don't know wh where the Chinese stand on this now with Trump as president. But if you feel any optimism that a treaty, in fact, could be reached, and if it could be passed in the Senate. So thanks. That's a really good question. Um, you know, I think a treaty could be concluded. Um, as I say, they progressed to a very advanced stage. Um, the Senate ratification of a US-China bit would be unlike any treaty we've done before. Um, uh, which are primarily with you know much smaller economies um, that are not serious threats either in terms of outsourcing of investment or concerns that would arise from the presence of their investors under a treaty protection in the United States. Um, so I, I don't I don't underestimate uh, the political challenge of that at all. I think what has to be done is to connect the provisions of that treaty to the concerns that we have expressed about the Chinese economy now for 15 or 20 years, um, and to see how that treaty actually enables us to make progress on leveling the playing field, so to speak, with state-owned enterprises, um, with protecting intellectual property, and, and getting at issues of forced technology transfers, and giving an international remedy um, when, uh, you know, the Chinese government um, uh, breaches the terms of the treaty because, um, you know, this is, this is a uniquely powerful tool. There are some who say, well, even if you had that, that sort of a treaty, no individual investor could s afford to stand up and make a claim, submit a claim to arbitration because they'd be subject to retaliation, which of course itself would be another breach. That could be true, and that could be a reason why, in the case of the U.S.-China context, the state-to-state -state dispute settlement procedures, which exist in all of our treaties, could actually become more important, because there could be systemic issues where it's the U.S. government who brings, who brings that kind of a claim. But it's a, it, politically, it's much more complicated and challenging than other existing treaties. Maggie, did you want to add anything to it? One brief thing about about the treaty is if a treaty, if tr any kind of bilateral investment treaty could be negotiated, it would be a much more benefit in bringing FDI to the United States than in the past because the purpose of the treaty is to protect against political risk in the host country, and the United States has just gone off the charts in terms of political risk. <laughs> I'm surprised that no one has mentioned the term political risk this afternoon, but if I were trying to figure out whether I wanted to invest in the United States, I would want to have some assurance of 
equal national treatment um, with domestic firms, and you think might think that a treaty might go a longer way towards that than, than it did under previous policy. Yes. A question for the panel. Uh, do you think there should be a distinction I'm sorry. Something? Yeah, Dave Frenzel from Penn United Technologies. Do you think there should be a distinction in uh, Chinese investment, for instance, or any state-managed economy uh, in terms of their FDI, whether it was a uh, firm that is state-managed and controlled or a private firm that's making the investment, uh, given the fact that we don't like our government buying up our businesses and running them? Should we let foreign governments do that? Yeah, I mean, that, that certainly is a topic of discussion. I mean, already um, state-owned enterprises that invest, if they're part of the CFIUS process, can be subject to a lengthier review um, than, than, than the private sector. But there are many people who advocate going much further than that and having a different and stricter criteria. Um, and uh, uh, to be honest, I think what, what you'd have to be very careful about how that's going to affect FDI and your economy overall. We could be we could be aiming at one problem in China and depriving ourselves of uh, investment from a lot of different locations. Um, is, there, is there really an economic argument in terms of the benefit of a free economy versus a planned economy? Well, in the world, there's another kind of comp competition going on, and it has it's in terms of one kind of political economy competing to win uh, the mankind's approval versus another kind of political economy. Which one really prospers us and makes us more free? I'm saying, shouldn't we think about that a little? Um, so I'm not aware of um, in economic theories debating about uh, how our policy should differ depending on the um, state ownership or the extent of state ownership in an enterprise. But I can speak to some of the evidence that recently emerged about the nature of Chinese outward FDI. So a big concern about Chinese outward FDI is obviously, like you mentioned, the state ownership, right? It, that's particularly true for some sectors and for some companies, like Huawei, for example. So, so it's a recent study, I think, by David Dollar and the co-authors looked into Chinese outward FDI in places like Africa. And they compared that with other you know, types of outward FDI from other countries. And they find, on average, these foreign investment activities coming from China are very similar to some of these FDI from countries like the US in terms of they are all profit driven. Right, so it's not maximizing. I mean, it's not like I don't care about profit. I have my own political agenda, so I don't really care about profits. But they find a lot of characteristics that suggest, on average, Chinese outward FDI, you know, is is driven by market considerations. But of course, that doesn't mean it's true for every single sector. So I think it's a sector by sector case. If I could just add something, I think that, that economists have had something to say this in terms of looking at the objectives of the foreign investors. And the real question that's suggested by, by Maggie's comment is, do they have a different objective? The most obvious concern is national security. That's why we have the CFIUS. What other types of concerns could there be? There could be anti-competitive effects. We have kind of standard ways of, of looking at it. It should also be pointed out that one of the biggest groups of foreign investors are sovereign wealth funds, and they bailed out the US financial system in 2008, 2009, or 2007, 2008. And so why did they do that? Maybe US diplomatic influence actually made them better investors than uh, private companies would be, which might and did not invest in the United States. So I think you have to be very careful and ask yourself, if you're concerned about state enterprises, what is your concern? And the real question is, how would they differ from a private investor abroad? And outside the national security area, it's very, very difficult to, but, but possible to find that. Other, other questions or comments? Other questions? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, Warren Coates, retired from the International Monetary Fund. Uh, for Ms. Chen, you indicated that most uh, Chinese investment or foreign direct investment in general in the U.S. takes the form of uh, acquisitions of existing companies. How does that do anything for jobs in the United States? Um, so 
we can think about the counterfactuals, right? So what if this company is not acquired by a Chinese multinational firm, right? Would that company continue, be able to continue its operations and production, continue with the employment, right? So, so I think, yes, maybe Chinese multinationals come in and they do not necessarily create a lot of new jobs, but at least, you know, it could, you know, keep the current employment stable, I and mean, that's one aspect of it. So I think um, M&A, the effect of M&A on employment is ambiguous because it's not greenfield FDI, it doesn't mean you're you know, building a new plant. But you know, it depends on what kind of benchmark we use, and what if we don't allow M&A, and the firm that, you know, that was com uncompetitive, will that firm remain you know, would the ability of hiring that many workers remain the same if we, uh, you know, don't allow them to be acquired? So I think it really depends on what the counterfactual is here. Do you want to add anything? To that? I just want to mention one example um, of a foreign takeover that probably saved the company, which was Fiat's takeover of Chrysler, which otherwise might have disappeared along with a lot of jobs in the automobile industry. So I think this is exactly right. The question is, if the foreign investor might be able to run the company better, might actually lead to an increase in employment, but in, in theory, it's ambiguous. Other, other questions? Other? Well, we're needing, we're almost to coffee break. So if people want to, we don't have any, uh, if we don't have any additional questions, we'll thank our speakers and we'll have a five minute addition onto the coffee break. So thank you very much for your contribution. Okay.